Good morning. Good morning. How are we doing? Good. So when I was a kid, uh, my family had a garden. And this was not just any garden. This was a garden that was way too large for the number of people that it fed. We shared the garden with my grandparents, and we both worked it. Uh, and, and my parents are going to watch this later, so I'm going to be very clear about something. I did not work very hard in the garden, okay? <laughs> I don't want to hear this later, so I did not work very hard in the garden. They did most of the work. However, being a young child, when I was asked to do anything in the Georgia heat, it was, it was a crime. I should not have been asked. But I was. And so we wound up doing all sorts of things in the garden. And looking back on it now, they're great memories that I have working with my family. But at the time, again, you just didn't want to want to go out there in the middle of the summer and all that. And so we had corn, we had okra, we had green beans, we had all these things. And we would break the beans, we'd shuck the corn, we'd do all this stuff. And really my great frustration with the garden was that I didn't see what I got out of it initially. Later on, there would be some benefit. But I didn't see what I got out of it. What was in it for me? And you might say, as my parents would say at the time, Travis, you get food out of it. We feed you from the garden. But again, I'm a kid. I don't want the vegetables coming from the garden. That thing's not growing hamburgers and french fries and pizza, so I'm out. I I don't see what I'm getting out of it. And very often, even as we grow up, we evaluate most of what we get into as to what we're going to get out of it. I want to know what I'm going to get out of this before I go there. You, you have a meeting. You're like, I hope this leads to a job or this leads to an investment opportunity or this leads to something good. Uh, maybe you, you go on a date and you're like, oh, I hope this leads to uh, future dates or not future dates if the person's not a great match. Uh, I hope I get something out of this, right? Our relationship with the Lord is the same. We very often approach our relationship with the Lord as wanting to gain something from the relationship. We want blessing from the Lord. We want him to bless our lives. We want to feel close to him. And in fact, that's not always uh, necessarily a bad idea, right? God tells us to come to him and he will bless us. God tells us these things. And so as long as that's not dominating what you're doing, I think there's a place for it in there, but, but we, we very much evaluate our understanding and our relationships with people based on this idea of reaping and sowing. We want to put into a relationship and we want to get something out of it, right? We want to put into a job and we get something out of it. So what we're doing today is we're taking kind of a, a little bit of a break from Galatians. We're going to wrap up the series on Galatians next week, but today we're really focused in on this idea that appears in Scripture numerous times, this idea of reaping and sowing. It appears from the beginning all the way to the end. It's an agrarian illustration to an agrarian society, but it appears again and again and again. And I want to talk today about really the three ways in which reaping and sowing appears in Scripture. And what I'm going to put to you today is that really your life is oriented around this law, this truth, that you reap what you sow more than you know it is. And what I also also want you to see is that it's going to be the broken nature of reaping and sowing in our life points us to a very great truth that God wants to share with us today. So we're going to start in Galatians 6, and we're going to be moving around throughout the the Bible today. But Galatians 6, uh, 7 to 10, and the first thing I want us to see is that we get exactly what we deserve. We get what we deserve. Look at verse 7 of Galatians 6. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, this is a very nice springboard out of our our sermon last week uh, into this week's discussion, and it is a very simple truth that what you put into something, you'll get back out of it. If I go into a garden and I sow apple seeds, what do we expect to come up? Apples, right, good job, biology, you're getting there. If I go in there and I put carrot seeds, what am I going to get out? Carrots. Carrots, very good, very good. And this is a truth that has been from the beginning of time. Look at Genesis 1, uh, 11. It'll be, uh, I think it's on the screen, maybe it's not. Um, Genesis 1, 11, and God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants, yielding seed and fruit trees, bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth, and it was so. So from creation, this is how things work. We're going to have a little bit of a birds and a bees lessons today, but if you get two tigers and they come together, what do they make? 
baby tiger, and they are precious. Two people get together. What do they make? A baby baby person, and sometimes they are precious. <laughs> and if you're a good friend, you won't say whether or not that's, you won't validate if that baby is not precious. You'd be like, yeah, it's adorable. Or the classic, it's so ugly, it's cute. That's one that, that in the South we used a lot. It also applies not just to physical things, but to relationships, right? If you are a nice person, historically people will be nice to you back. If you're a big fat jerk, people will be a big fat jerk back to you. This is kind of how we know things go, but it also works in our relationship with the Lord, right? Spiritually, it works like this. The Bible says it right here. If you sow the works of the flesh, you'll reap destruction, you'll reap uh, uh, selfishness. This is the works of the flesh that are talked about in Galatians 5. Sexual immorality, envy, all these things are, are, are works, actions that you do that bend you back on yourself, that make you self-centered and self-focused. And so these are called works of the flesh. These are things you do sort of to yourself and to those around you. But notice also in the passage, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And that's a very intentional difference, fruit versus work. Because even though we can go into a garden and we can plant apple seeds and we can do everything we're supposed to do, ultimately, who is it up to if something sprouts? God. I physically cannot make an apple tree grow. And I guarantee you, you could give me the greatest, most perfect apple location in the world to plant something, and I will find a way to kill it. Because ultimately, it's up to God. It is up to God to make things grow. And that's what the fruit of the Spirit is. You can't make yourself be more joyful. You can't make yourself be more faithful. But when you're a follower of Christ, as you devote your life more and more to Christ, as you give your life more to him, as you delve deeply into that relationship with him, and you see how much he loves you and how much he sacrificed for you, all of a sudden, because you're connected to the vine, you're abiding in Christ, love, joy, peace, patience, all of those things start blossoming in your life. And that's how fruit is different than work. But it makes sense. You reap what you sow. You get out of it what you put in. Now, it's important for us to till the soil. It's important for us to be involved in the process, right? That's why we have the spiritual disciplines. It's why we pray. It's why we fast. It's why we spend time in God's word. We're working with Christ. But this idea of reaping and sowing, of getting what you put in, that that's a concept that appears regularly in Scripture. Job 4.8, if you sow iniquity and trouble, you get back the same things. Proverbs 22.8, if you sow injustice, you get back calamity. There is something about this we feel incredibly satisfied with, right? When somebody is speeding and they zip through the red light and they blatantly run through the red light and they, nobody pulls them over, no blue lights flash. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to chase you down and I'm going to give you a ticket. It has no legal value, but I want you to know you did something wrong. And you can't tell me that there is not a secret part of you way down deep inside that cheers like you were at a football game. When somebody does that and the blue lights go up and you're like, oh my gosh, I get to see justice, fairness. We almost salivate over it. And those of you that don't, you're the one that's speeding and running the red lights. <laughs> and I hope you get caught. And I hope you get caught in front of me so I can watch it. I may even pull over and just pop popcorn and just be like, I'm just going to watch it go down. It sickens us when people get away with things when they deserve punishment, when they deserve wrath. And it sickens us when people are punished and they are wrongly punished, right? Right? It bothers us. We firmly believe that you should reap what you sow. We firmly believe it. We wish it were true all the time, all the time, but it's not. It's not. We want people to reap what they sow, but at the same time, we live in an unfair and unjust world. There's a great uh, comic strip, Calvin and Hobbes. Anybody big Calvin and Hobbes fans at all? Nice. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, fun fact about Calvin and Hobbes, in case you didn't know, it's actually based on hypothetical conversations that John Calvin would have with Thomas Hobbes, the philosopher. So go and have fun with that if you want. If I just ruined Calvin and Hobbes for you, I'm sorry. But anyway, 
There's a great comic strip where Calvin's upset that he has to go and go to bed early. And the parents are all getting to stay up late. And he says, it's not fair that the parents get to stay up late. And of course, what does his dad say? Life's not fair. And Calvin responds this way. He says, I know, but why isn't it ever unfair in my favor? (laughs) And y'all, that's what we want. If life's got to be unfair, and we all know that it is, why? We want it to be unfair in our favor. We want it to be unfair in our favor because we want life to be fair. And we all agree life should be fair. We just talked about how we want justice. But the thing is, we have two problems with it. One, we're not willing to sacrifice our stuff to make things more fair for other people, right? We're not willing to do that. That's some brand of communism that we don't want, and we're just, no, I'm not going to do that. And because deep inside, we feel like we've been treated unfairly, and we've overcome those uh, 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 injustices in order to be where we're at. And here's the thing. Every single person in the world at some point has been treated unfairly. Did you ever get in a fight in school? Somebody punches you and you punch them back. And who's the one that gets in trouble? It's always the person that gets punched second or the, the, the punches second, right? That's when the teacher sees it. Maybe you got in trouble for something that you didn't deserve. Maybe you got in trouble as a kid. Or maybe, hey, you got laid off and it wasn't fair. We all think we've been a victim of some injustice. And the truth of the matter is we all have. But it's one of the reasons why we feel like, well, man, the deck is stacked against me. I've got to hold on to everything I've got. The other reason we have an issue with it is because we want people to get exactly what they deserve unless I am the one who deserves pain and suffering and discomfort. If I'm the one who deserves to be punished, I don't want that. I want mercy, right? I want mercy from my doctors. I want mercy from my employers. I work for Rodney, so I don't get it ever. Um, (laughs) I want mercy from the justice system. I want mercy from the IRS. I want it from my boss. I want it from insurance. I want it from God. I want mercy all the time, all the time, as long as it applies to me. You see, the truth of the matter is we do not live in a fair and just society. And one of the reasons why we don't live in a fair and just society is because our ability to understand when to be harsh in our judgment and when to be merciful is completely skewed. We don't know. We don't know. It's because sin has entered into the world. And so oftentimes when we should be gentle and kind, we wind up being too harsh. And oftentimes when we really should throw the book at somebody, when they deserve punishment. And you see it. You see it when somebody gets out on parole and then they immediately go and commit a crime. We're like, oh my gosh, this is why we shouldn't have parole. No, parole is fine. The problem is our inability to rightly judge when to be just or when to be harsh in our judgment and when to be merciful. Oftentimes what it is, it's like flying a plane and you've never flown before and it's storming outside. And the plane is doing this. It's pitching and rolling, right? The whole whole time. And so sometimes we're too harsh, we're too, too, too judgmental, and then sometimes we're too merciful. And you're pitching and rolling the whole time. And in the middle of that, at some point when you're flying the plane, just based on geometry, even if it's just for a fraction of a second, that plane is level. It won't feel like it, but it is. And that's how we we are in our society. We're either too harsh or too merciful, but sometimes we get it just right. And it's because of sin. It's because of brokenness in our world. Our ability to judge what's fair and just is messed up. It's why we can't agree on abortion. It's either all right or it's all wrong. And the reason why we can't come to an agreement on it is because our ability to determine what is fair and just is skewed. It's skewed. So what do we say to all this? One, we need an admission of humility on our part. The only one who knows exactly what is righteous and just is God. And so anytime you have to enter into a judgment on anybody, whether it's your kids, whether it's breaking up with somebody, whether it's leaving a job, whether it's confronting an employee, whether it's being a juror, whatever it is, you have to approach with humility and say, I don't know. I am not completely wise. I don't know if I should be merciful here or or completely harsh, unflinching in my justice. I don't know. And we go to God and we seek his wisdom. 
We have to constantly, with our spouses, seek to be fair and merciful and recognize that we want the same things. Secondly, we need to recognize that we get a good deal more than we deserve. We get a good deal more justice than we probably deserve, and we get a good deal more mercy than we probably deserve, too. And so we have to cry out to God. Let him forgive us for the ways in which we failed. Maybe there's people you do apologize to because you have been too harsh. We'll come back to this later, but ultimately this leads us to the second way in which reaping and sowing appears in Scripture. Because it's not just that we get what we deserve, we also get as much of it as we deserve. We get as much of it as we deserve. Look at 2 Corinthians 9.6. 9.6, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So what Paul's done here is, classic fundraising move, he has bragged about the church at Corinth to all the other churches about how much money they're going to give for a relief fund to the Jerusalem church that is being persecuted. So that's what he's done. And now he's writing back to the church at Corinth, who seems to be giving just a little bit less than what he thought. And he's like, hey guys, you're going to embarrass me in front of all of the churches. So you need to sow generously. Great fundraising move. I keep telling the church we need to use it with y'all, but nobody listens to me. So it's fine. It's probably good. Anyway, Paul is asking them, and he's saying, he's using this principle of reaping and sowing and saying a farmer that goes out to sow isn't sweating how many seeds he throws out because he understands cognitively that the more seed I put out, the bigger my crop will be, and the bigger the crop is, the more seeds I will have next year to have an even bigger crop. You sow sparingly, you have a smaller crop. And again, we find ourselves being like, yeah, that makes sense. That totally makes sense. I should get more out of something the more I put into it. The more effort, the more work I put into something, the more I should get out of it. The harder I work out at the gym, the more chiseled my abs should be. That is a law of nature, right? The more I put in to an investment, the more money I should get out of it. That is the way it should work. Our standing belief is the more you put into something, the more effort or resource or time or energy you should get back out. The return should be proportional. That is a semblance of justice. But it doesn't always work that way, does it? It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes you can work really, really hard on something and get absolutely little to nothing back. How many of you have worked on a project at work, spent months on it, presented it, got it approved, and at the last moment, it just fell apart and nothing ever came of it? And you're like, well, that was a whole year of work just down the drain right there. How many of us have worked on, on a patient, found a treatment plan for a patient, you, you doctors and nurses and medical professionals, and that patient still passed away despite the effort you put in, right? We don't always get back what we put in. When we're raising our kids. You work really hard to raise your children and to raise them in the way that you think they should go. And they do this thing where they grow up and they become something other than what you wanted for them. Sometimes it could be really tragic and, and just nothing that anybody would ever want for that kid's life. Sometimes they just do something like don't go to your alma mater or they take a gap year and you're like gasp, a gap year. They're never going to turn out the way I wanted them to. Or you invest in something that sounds like a really great idea up front. And then it winds up not being such a great idea. And no, your fantasy football league is not an investment. Stop telling your wife that. <laughs> it's not what it is. But we apply this to our spiritual life as well, right? I give five minutes to God in the morning. I give an hour at church. I should get his blessings back. I'm putting something into it. I should get a proportionate res return back. And the more I pray, the more I invest, the more I should get something back from him. But what if, and this is a big what if, but what if the unrealized expectations, what if the concept of reaping and sowing and reaping and sowing in proportion, what if when that breaks, God's actually telling us something? What if there's a secret truth that's lodged in this that when we, when we discover it, it's going to change the way we think about everything? 
Because we agree that when you put time and energy into something, you should get something out of it. But here's the thing, something's broken. And that's the truth that God wants you to see. Something is broken. You see, the idea that when you put effort or energy or investment into something, you should get something out of it, that's called work. And work is good. Work is a good thing. It was given to man before ever the fall, before ever sin was in the world, work was given to us. Genesis 2.15 says that God put humans in the garden to work it and keep it. And he's not talking about dancing when he says work it. It is tilling the soil. It's harvesting, reaping, and sowing. That's what he's talking about. They didn't just walk through the garden buck naked, picking things off of trees. No, they actually had to work. But every time they worked on it, every time they put into it, guess what happened? It yielded a crop. It yielded fruit. It yielded del- the most delicious fruit you probably ever had. But then something happens in Genesis 3. There's the fall. The fall happens. Adam ate from the tree that he wasn't supposed to. He harvested. He reaped from the one place he wasn't supposed to reap from. And then something gets introduced into work, and it's called toil. Look what happens in Genesis 3. Genesis 3, 17, God is handing down curses. And he says to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. Now, when you work in a garden, now when you want to harvest things, guess what? There's this stuff called blight that can take your entire crop. There's these things called locusts that can just eat up everything. There's this stuff called drought or too much water. Now all of a sudden there's stuff, there's weeds that grow up with the crops. And this isn't just agrarian illustrations either. Let's go back to those work examples we talked about before. The project that you worked on for so long and it gets killed. Guess what? Thorns and thistles. It should have yielded a result. It didn't. The patient that passes away despite your best efforts. Thorns and thistles. children that you, you, you work on teaching, if you're a teacher, an educator, how many of you have sat up working on your lesson plans because there's this one kid that just has your heart and they're having a real hard time and you've devoted so much energy to trying to get this one, light bulb to come on in this one kid's life and guess what happens? You can't get it to turn on. That's thorns and that's thistles and it's toil and you, you, you leave that, that, that kid moves on from your grade or maybe they don't. And you think to yourself, what am I even doing this for? What's the purpose of me being a teacher? I must be terrible at what I do. I'm a terrible doctor. I'm a terrible nurse. I'm a terrible pastor. Because I can't get this to work. Thorns and thistles. It's toil. This means your job can be both fulfilling, but it also can be disappointing. And this shows up in our personal lives too. Some of you have had marriages that you put decades into and then it fails. Some of you put years into a relationship with a, with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and it falls apart. Why? Thorns and thistles. It's toil. The workout regimen for the chiseled abs. As you get older, I've got bad news for you, young people. The chisel gets duller, is all I'll say. All of this is toil, and it is a constant reminder that things are broken, and that we need a rescue. The fact that you don't get in proportion to what you sow is a reminder that we need help. And every single time, embedded within every single failure you have, is a voice, is a whisper, is a reminder that you don't get what you deserve. And the enemy wants to turn that into a challenge to God, but God takes that concept of you not getting what you deserve, and he blesses us. And let's talk about that, because that's the third way it appears is we don't always get what we deserve. We don't get what we deserve. This is the final way that reaping and sowing shows up in Scripture. And in Hosea 10, 12 to 11, it talks about reaping and sowing. So it starts off exactly like you would think it would. 
Read verses 10 to 12 to the end of the chapter. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is the time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. You have plowed iniquity. You have reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies, because you have trusted in your own way and in the multitude of your warriors. Therefore, the tumult of war shall arise among your people, and all your fortresses shall be destroyed. Shalmon destroyed Beth Arbal on the day of battle. Mothers were dashed in pieces with their children. Thus it shall be done to you, O Bethel, because because of your great evil. At dawn, the king of Israel shall be utterly cut off. And we read that and we think, all right, reaping and sowing makes sense. If they do good things, God's going to bless them. If they do bad things, bad things are going to happen to them. And we're like, okay, yeah, that's how it's supposed to work. I think that's how that works. But then look at what happens in chapter 11. And I want you to see this. I want you to see the agony that God has within himself over this concept of reaping and sowing. Let's talk about it. Verse uh, verse 1 of chapter 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away, and they kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. That's another name for Israel. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. And we're like, okay, that's pretty harsh. And then verse 8, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Something incredible is happening in this passage. The concept of reaping and sowing is being overturned before our very eyes, or at least the promise of it. There's a promise of the overturning of reaping and sowing, and you see it in two places. The first one is in verse 1 of chapter 11. God says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt, I called my son. And we read this, and we're like, oh, yeah. God brought, I saw the prince of Egypt, I know. God brought him out of Egypt. That makes sense. But if you go to Matthew, if you go to the gospel of Matthew, Jesus is born, and there's some people who want to kill him. Yeah, like right out of the gate, Jesus has enemies. And so an angel appears to Joseph, says, take Joseph to Egypt to escape. And then when it's time for those people to be gone, angel appears to Joseph again and says, the people who wanted to kill him are gone. And they take Jesus to Nazareth at that point. And it says, Matthew says, this is to fulfill the prophecy that says, out of Egypt, I called my son. This is a prophecy. This is a promise that the son being called out of Egypt isn't Israel at all. It's the Messiah. The second place you see it is in verse 9. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Think again about Jesus. When we're at Christmas time, we sing a song, right? How's it go? Oh, come, oh, come. I'm not going to sing it. Who's supposed to come? Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Another way to read that is God in our midst. God in our midst. And how does God come in Matthew and in Luke? Does he arrive in fire and, and, and burning? And No. He's a baby. He does not come in wrath. He comes in tenderness and gentleness and mercy, and he takes that all the way to the cross. He suffers and he dies for us. All of us are just like Israel in this Hosea passage. We continually turn to our own ways. We are bent towards not following God. We've sown things in our own lives, and we've reaped destruction. We've reaped bad habits. We've reaped evil in our own lives. And we've sown things in the lives of other people where they've reaped evil as well. And we should get what we deserve, but we don't. And the reason why we don't is because of what Christ has done for us. Christ takes that harvest 
from us and instead gives us a harvest of love and affection and joy and acceptance by God. Let me put it to you another way. If I go out and plant a field of dandelions, you might think I'm crazy, yes, but if that garden all of a sudden sprouts apple trees, we'll all call that a miracle, right? That's a miracle. When you put a dead body in the ground, you should expect to find the dead body still in the ground. The fact that Jesus comes back to life is nothing, sh nothing short of sowing a dead body and reaping a living, glorified body. That's what it is. It's a miracle. And you have an opportunity in your life today to break the cycle of reaping and sowing by giving your life to Christ, by giving him everything in your life. You bury your disappointments, you bury your failures, you bury some of your hopes and dreams with him in the tomb, and it's raised up no longer in shame, no longer in weakness, but in glory and honor and power. This is what he offers us today. This is why we do baptism. This is why we do this. It is a picture, it's an image of sowing into the tomb and reaping a new life. That's what it's for. That's why we're going to do it next week in the outdoor baptism. If you want to get baptized, that is a great place to be baptized. Outdoors, everybody's cheering and celebrating, and it's warm enough because this is Texas. Don't miss out on that opportunity. You won't regret it. So what do we do? What do we do? First, if you are a believer in Christ, you must rest. There's this thing called the year of Jubilee in the Old Testament where, where God would, would allow the, he commanded that the, the, the fields would lie fallow. You wouldn't plant on them. And it's a sign of trusting him. Some of us believe so passionately in reaping and sowing that we are giving our lives day in and day out to this idea of reaping and sowing that we just keep putting in and keep putting in and keep putting in and keep putting in. And guess what? You're holding on too tight. You need to rest. You need to let the Lord work. That relationship that's struggling, that, that uh, workplace that you're, you're dealing with, that relationship with your child that's struggling, guess what? You need to be patient. You need to rest and let the Lord work. He's the one that provides the crop. Secondly, secondly, if you are not a believer in Christ, you need to sow your failures and your, your hopelessness in him and let him raise you to life. You can do that later on. You can come and talk to me about it. We can go get lunch. We can talk right down here. I'll tell you how to do it. And lastly, in Galatians 6, 9 to 10, winding up where we started, it says, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Jesus has broken the cycle of sowing and reaping, of getting what you deserve. And so our job as followers of Christ is now to do the exact same thing. You've got to break the cycle in other people's lives. So some of us have been treated so badly by other people. And what we want to do is we want to get back at them. We want to withhold affection from them. Guess what? You break the cycle of reaping and sowing by offering forgiveness. You offer them what they don't deserve. There are people who are struggling around you. They've maybe had less opportunities or like life has handled them, handed them really bad things. They got bad seeds, whatever it is. You break the cycle you give them a harvest that they don't deserve because you got a harvest that you don't deserve. And that's what it means to be a follower of Christ. That's what following Jesus is. That's what serving is. It is instinctively going into somebody else's life, somebody else's garden that's full of thorns and thistles, and you sow in their lives love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, and you watch the harvest grow. That's what you do. You break the cycle of reaping and sowing because that law has been overturned. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for a new harvest and a new life. I pray that you would give us the opportunities and the courage to sow well and to sow plentiful in the lives of other people that we might reap bountifully, not just us, but the kingdom and others as well. It's in your name we pray. Amen.